Welcome to New Life Living, brought to you by New Life Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Is there an afterlife? Are heaven and hell just religious fantasies? This Bible teaching series, led by Pastor Alan Brooks, will reveal what we know, what we don't know, and what you need to know before you go beyond death's door. We're in a heavy subject today, if you haven't figured that out already. Hell is for real. I know it's not a popular subject. I can honestly tell you that I've not looked forward to even bringing the message today. I've shared with you some of these other stories that I've read recently, at least clips from about people who have died and woke up in heaven. What we don't often realize, though, sometimes is there's as many of them, if maybe not more, that don't end up in heaven, that like Tamra, end up in what seems to be hell. Now, to be clear here, Tamara didn't go to hell, because nobody's in hell yet. She's, as we've talked in this series already, been given a glimpse of what Hades was like, this place of detention. It's not unlike what we've talked about Metro Detention Center is in our community here. It's a place that people wait until they're sentenced, and then they go typically to the state pen or some other place to carry out that sentence, in some cases even a life sentence. But as we look at this study today, one of the things that I want to share with you is I've, I've looked at and I've read a number of these stories, and I can tell you that there's some striking similarities. Most of the people who talk about having experienced hell or Hades will tell you that they died and there was this falling, this sinking kind of feeling that they had. And then from there, that was just pitch darkness, this pervasive darkness that overcame them. And there were screams of terror that just rang out in the entire place. And they said, although many times they didn't have any bodily substance, they didn't have a substance to their body, there was still sensation. They could experience this incredible heat, the dehydration of the heat. Many of them spoke about physical as well as sexual assault of demons that were coming upon their bodies. Let me assure you, if you haven't already made up your mind about this, that hell is for real. Now, unfortunately, we live in a culture today that tries to be dismissive of the idea of hell. I saw a study here recently and um, in that study, the researchers at Simpson Fraser University, the, the title of the study was The Emotional Toll of Hell, they said that the belief in hell that many of us here have and the religious malviolence more generally may contribute to the encouragement of rule following through the deterrence of the value of supernatural punishment. But notice, and this is their main point, but do so at the cost of well-being. Let me kind of break that down for you a little bit. What they're trying to say is that if you and I believe in hell, it's going to make our life here a lot less happy. Now, I've got to tell you that I would rather believe in hell here now and be unhappy a little bit about it than spend all of my eternity faced with the reality of it. Do you see where the focus of this study is? The study is the same kind of focus that many of us, unfortunately, have. It has an earthly focus. We're caught up in the here and the now. We don't have this heavenly mindset that we've talked about in this series repeatedly. And that's, guys, where we've got to get to. We've got to get to a place that we take our eyes off of the here and now and look to the ultimate of what's going on. As I've said a few times in this series, this series really is fundamentally not about doctrines. We talk a lot about doctrines of heaven and hell and the afterlife, but it's more importantly about destinies because there are some that you and I love and care about, maybe some even in this room, who their destiny right now would be an eternity in hell. And I don't know how you feel about that. I don't know if that bothers you, but it should. It should bother you that there are people that you know people that you care about, that unless they change course, that's just a hint of what they're going to experience. The bad news is it gets worse than that, because that's just Hades. That's just a preview of the coming attractions of hell. 
I've run across a number of arguments against hell, probably some that you've seen. But I believe that the biggest problem isn't from outside the church, like these researchers that I quoted. The bigger problem, I believe, in our world today is inside the church. It's people that profess to be believers and Christians who deny the reality of hell. I've never been, that I'm aware of, to a funeral service where the preacher said that that person went to hell. Now, I've got to tell you, I don't even know that it would be appropriate if they were to do so. But I've been to a lot of services where you got the impression that no matter how bad of a character the individual was, that they were in a better place. Really? They had no connection, they had no relationship with Jesus, but somehow they're in a better place? How is that even possible? Not according to the book that I've been reading, because it says something very different. We see this idea that everybody goes to heaven. It fits into this idea of universalism that we've talked about here, that our God is a God of love, which he is, but he's also a just God. He's also a God of wrath, who hates sin, and sent his son to pay the punishment and the penalty of sin for those who would believe. What a farce it would be to our God to give his son's life if there was no penalty to be paid, if there was no hell to be avoided. I've actually been rebuked. I'm one of those rare pastors who actually talks about hell in a funeral message. I've been rebuked by some, not for saying somebody went to hell, but because I didn't say the individual went to heaven. Now, my position's always been that unless I have a confidence about some, something in your family or I know about you personally that tells me that I have a belief that you went to heaven, I'm not going to tell the crowd that you did. I'm not going to say that you went to hell. Hey, that's between you and God. But the reality is I don't want the rest of the crowd out there to have the false oppression that, wow, you can live your life however you want, and everybody goes to this better place. Clark Pinnock, who's recently deceased, was a Christian university professor and author. Note what he said. He said, I consider the concept of hell as endless torment in body and mind, note his words, an outrageous doctrine. How can Christians possibly project a deity of such cruelty and vindictiveness, he says, whose ways include inflicting everlasting torture upon his creatures, however sinful they may have been. Then notice this statement. Surely a God who would do such a thing is more nearly like Satan than like God. He's apparently not seeing the same God of the Bible that I'm seeing. I find it fascinating when people like him find that the creation, us, gets to tell the creator what's right and what's wrong. Others have an idea that hell is for now. Some of you might recognize the name of Rob Bell, who was a pastor. His statement is that hell is not about someday somewhere else, but about the various hells on earth that people experience in this life. Genocide, rape, and unjust socioeconomic structures. Now, while it's true that earth is the closest to hell that some will ever get, it's also the closest to heaven that some will will ever get. I believe, and hopefully you do too, that the beliefs in heaven and hell stand or fall together. You can't separate them from each other. The place we find out about heaven is in this book, the same book that tells us about hell. And we don't get to pick and choose. We don't say, well, I like those verses about heaven, but I'm just going to disregard these verses about hell. They stand or fall together. I've heard it said that Jesus spoke more about hell than heaven. Now, frankly, I don't know that to be true, but this I do know. Jesus spoke more about hell than any other New Testament author we have. Some would have us believe that Jesus just preached a gospel of good news and love and forgiveness. Did he? He did preach that kind of a message, but that wasn't the only message that he preached. As we get into our study here this morning in Revelation, I want to fast forward you a little bit because what's going to happen at the end of days, according to the Bible, 
is there's going to be seven years of great tribulation upon the earth. During that time, Satan and his dominion are going to pretty much run rampant. We're going to see a scroll that has seven seals on it. And each time a seal comes off of that scroll, bad stuff happens. And then once the scroll is released, Scripture doesn't say this, but part of my belief is what's written on there is the worst yet to come, which are the trumpets of God, the bowls of God's wrath they are going to be poured out upon the earth. That all happens during a seven-year period of time. What we're looking at here today is at the end of that seven-year period when God's wrath starts to wind down. So if you would, if you haven't done so already, I'd have you turn to Revelation. We're mainly in chapter 20 this morning, but I'm going to have you back up a few verses into chapter 19. As many of you probably know, the chapters and verses weren't divinely inspired like the text was. Back in verse 20 of chapter 19, it says, The beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a little while. The lake of fire that we read about here is what we normally associate as this place called hell. What you will find in Scripture is that fire and hell run together. Fire in Scripture is almost always representative of God's judgment when you see it on the pages of Scripture. The text uses a particular Greek word here for hell. It's a different word than what we've seen before, which was Hades, that temporary place that the unbelievers went to. This word here is Gehenna. Gehenna is used a total of 12 times in the New Testament. Catch this. 11 of the 12 times were all out of the mouth of the same person. You know who that person was? It was Jesus. In fact, the only exception was the half-brother of Jesus, James, who used this word. Here's what Jesus said of Gehenna, or hell. Our Mark 9, verse 43 and 48. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. For those of you who know that passage, you know that he talked about some other body parts you might want to deal with as well. But he says it's better to enter eternal life with only one hand than to go into the, note this, the unquenchable fires of hell with two hands. And then down in 48 it says where the maggots never die and the fire never goes out. We also see in our Revelation passage this bottomless pit, this abyss. And Satan is cuffed and stuffed and put not into the lake of fire, as you would think. He's actually put into the abyss. And for the thousand-year reign of Christ upon the earth, Satan is bound and held into this abyss. Now, let me give you a little bit of information about the bottomless pit, the abyss. It would seem that when the angels, a third of them, Scripture tells us, rebelled against God and followed Satan, some were allowed to roam the earth and conduct their bad business. But there were others that were really bad, and they were put into the abyss. You might recall that in Luke, when Jesus was casting out these thousand demons that were in this man in the tombs, that what the demons begged of Jesus was what? Please don't put us in the abyss, in the pit. 
They didn't want to be confined there. Jude, I believe, speaks of this. Our verse 6 says, I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them. In other words, those who were allowed to stay on the earth had to submit to a certain level of God's authority to be on the earth. Those that were confined, it says God kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness waiting for that great day of judgment. Now whether the abyss and Hades are connected, we're not able to really tell. But in Revelation 9, when the fifth trumpet is blown... It says that Satan is given a key to unlock the abyss. And these super bad demons are now released from this place, the worst of which apparently is the beast as one of them. Now if you would go back to Revelation 20, and let's go down to verse 7 in our passage there. So again, we've got Satan bound in the abyss for the thousand-year reigns. And then it says, when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and false prophet were. And they were tormented day and night forever and ever. So now we see that Satan has his last stand. Now I've got to tell you, I've always been kind of confused by this. It would have seemed to me that when the beast and the false prophet were cast into the lake of fire, when they were sent to hell, as it were, you would have thought that Satan himself would have got thrown in there. Why is he being enabled that a thousand years later that he's going to get released and come back out and do what he's notorious for doing, which is deceiving people? Some people ask, who are those people? I mean, who, who would be deceived by him? I mean, for a thousand years, Jesus has been reigning on the earth. I don't know this to be true because Scripture doesn't reveal it to be true. But I wonder if, in some respects, God doesn't allow Satan to be released and go about deceiving people again to defeat this romantic notion that some of us have that if we just had godly leaders, we would all behave better. Because apparently that's not the case. Because apparently after a thousand years of Jesus being on the throne, there's still people willing to follow the prince of darkness and go to work for him. These are people most likely that were children born to people who survived the tribulation. Certainly some of those became believers in Jesus, while others, not so much. But finally, 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 Satan gets cast into the lake of fire. And he joins his two cohorts, the beast and the false prophet, who were the first two people to get there. Notice what the passage says about it, though. It says that they are tormented, how long? Day and night forever. 24-7, 365, or whatever that is, forever. Let's go back to verse 11 and look at the part that affects some of our creation. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. The death in Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. 
We talked about the Bema or Bema seat, depending on the way you want to pronounce that, which is this place that believers will appear before. We talked about that last week. Now we look at the place where the unbeliever has to appear before God, the great white throne. Now, think about these people just for a moment, because from the moment that they died, they've been in Hades. That means most of them were in Hades through the seven years of tribulation, through the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. They've been in there a really long time. And you remember that glimpse that we saw of what that was like to be down there. That had to have seemed like an eternity to them. To me, it gives new definition to being on death row because that's essentially what they are. They're waiting for their execution to finally take place in hell. Today in our society, when a person gets sentenced to death, they're on death row for an average of 10 years. Some as long as 20 or 30 years on death row. Now, there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of debate about this, but ironically, when the death penalty was first enacted in the United States, it was usually within a few days or a few months at most before somebody was executed. None of this years kind of stuff. But what started to happen over time is it got pushed out by appeals and stuff over time. And in 1890, the Supreme Court remarked about this, and said that these long delays between sentencing and execution, compounded by the prisoner's uncertainty over the time of execution, could be agonizing, resulting in horrible feelings and immense mental anxiety amounting to a great increase in the offender's punishment. In other words, the Supreme Court is arguing, let's get this done quickly because the emotional toil that this has on people waiting for their sentence to be carried out is excruciating. Wow, I wonder how that compares to a thousand years in Hades. See, we think sometimes about the physical element of Hades and what that was like, but the mental and emotional may have been even more traumatizing in a lot of ways. We see before they appear at the great white throne that death and Hades give up the dead. And note that as soon as death and Hades have fulfilled their purpose, they, death and Hades, are cast into the lake of fire as well. But now everyone who refused to believe in the name of Jesus stands before Jesus. They stand guilty of all the things that they've done wrong because they're not covered by his blood. But worse than that, they stand guilty of their unbelief. And quite frankly, that's their greatest sin. Because that's what scripture reveals that ultimately they're being judged for, having not believed in the name of Jesus. And because their name's not in the book of life, they're cast into the lake of fire. And contrary to a lot of these funeral messages we hear, it's not a few people that end up in the lake of fire, it's many who land up in the lake of fire. Jesus in Matthew 7 said, the highway to hell is broad, its gate is wide for the, what? Many, he says who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. In case you don't know that today, hell is our default choice. When we are born into this life, we are born into sin. We are born separated from God. And unless we choose to depart from that highway which leads to hell and take that exit ramp that says Jesus on it, that's where we're going to end up. People say, well, I never chose that. It's because you never chose not to have that. Sadly, here it says few ever find that exit to Jesus. Do you know why that is? Part of the reason I think it is they're not looking They're not eternally minded, they're earthly minded, they're focused on this life and having a good time now. 
They're not worried about the hereafter, which lasts quite a lot longer from what I've read than the now. When you look at the full hell experience, I think we have to go back to when we were talking about the resurrected bodies a few weeks ago. And we talked about this heightened sense of awareness that our senses are working at full capacity. I'd just like to be in Hades and hell with your senses working at full capacity. Perfect vision, but nothing but darkness around you. Perfect hearing, able to hear every sound from great distances. But what are the sounds you're hearing? The screams of everybody else that's down there. I got to tell you, if you're afraid of the dark like I am somewhat, this is going to be the worst kind of dark. The smell is another thing that so many of these stories have talked about. This horrid smell, a mix of sulfur, the burning and the rotting of flesh all around. Then, of course, we have the intensity of that physical pain, the extreme heat and the dehydration that comes with it, and absolutely nothing we could do about it. And then the mental awareness, that emotional understanding that you can't change anything now. And that all you had to do was listen to one of those crazy pastors who talked to you about Jesus. Who gave you an opportunity to get off the highway, to take an exit. That's pretty traumatizing, I think. The duration of hell is undisputed for the beast and the false prophet and Satan. Scripture says very plainly that they are punished eternally. There is debate in Christian circles about how long it lasts for humans. Some see it as eternal punishment, quoting the words of Jesus out of Matthew 25, our verse 46, where Jesus says they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Others on the other side of the camp think that when they go into the lake of fire, they're actually annihilated. They too use the words of Jesus out of Matthew 10, where he says, Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And the idea of destroy there is to annihilate. If, in fact, it is annihilation for human beings, that would only be God's mercy. But don't think they got off easy because they had at least a thousand years in Hades and what had to have seemed like eternal torment. Yesterday, I was with the men of the church here, and on the way home, I, I saw a truck, and on the back window, The person had written in and decal had this, ask me if I care. I wasn't sure exactly what he meant by that. But I wonder sometimes if I really care the way that I should. Because as I said in the beginning, we all know people right now that are on the highway to hell. They're living apart from Jesus. Do I care? Am I trying to do what I can to help that? Am I coming to them with the good news of what God has done for them? And make sure you don't miss this, because I think this is where we mess up a lot of times. It's not good news to people unless they know the bad news. They have to know that hell is for real. If they believe what every other funeral message they've heard is said, that this person is now in heaven and they knew the guy was so far from Jesus that he was, you know, nothing compared to them, then they're not going to be too concerned about it. You know, the biggest problem people have that are on the highway to hell, they don't think they have a problem. They think all's good. And we need to come along in love and encourage them to say, hey, look at what this book says. It says, beyond death's door, there's this place and there's that place. And unless you get it right before you go through the door, that's going to be your final answer. 
You know, from there, they've got to make a choice for themselves no different than you and I have to. I hear sometimes Christians say things like, well, it serves them right. They deserve to go to hell. Could I add this? So do you. So do I. That apart from the blood of Jesus and putting my faith and trust in him, I deserve hell. I deserve damnation. And so do you. You're not any better than any of those people are in spite of what you think. And you and I need to develop the compassion in our heart for the lost and dying of this world. Because their future is scary. It's not a future that I want for myself. And it's not a future I want for anybody that I care about. D.L. Moody once said that I will not preach hell unless I preach it with tears. And we should preach it with tears. We should not want our worst enemy to spend one moment in hell. Because that's not our Father's heart either. Peter wrote a second letter. We call it Second Peter. It's our chapter 3. And let me just share part of it with you. Peter writes, I want to remind you that in the last days scoffers will come, mocking the truth, following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the time of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens by the word of his command. And he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They're being kept for the day of judgment, when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. The heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire. The elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. Amen? What a glorious hope that we have in Christ. But we should have our Father's heart our Father's heart is that all would be in Christ, that all would have a change of mind. That's what repentance is. It's a change of mind, a change of belief that leads to a change of behavior. Maybe some of you here today hearing this message need to have a change of mind leading to a change of behavior. Don't put it off. You don't know the day you're going to die any more than I do. It could happen today. Are you ready to pass over the threshold? Has that relationship between you and Jesus been firmly established? And if it hasn't, today's the day. Get it right today. Don't leave this place without getting it right. Because all you have to do is choose to believe. If you're some of the rest of us, though, who were firm in that, were established in that, Let's get our eyes off of this junk around here. Let's put our eyes on the future, on the eternal. Let's start to realize that we need to be talking. We need to be engaging in conversation with other people that don't think the same way we do. To give them this good news message so that they too can come with. 
don't know about you, but I don't want to go by myself. I realize I'd be with a number of you, if not most of you. But there's other people that I care about that aren't in this room. There's those other people that I want to go with. And how are they going to know, Scripture says, unless somebody tells them? Church, would you be the one? Would you stand? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for what has been a really hard message to prepare for, but a truthful one, Lord, a truth that every one of us needs to grab a hold of, that not only is heaven for real, but hell is for real too, Lord. And Father, I'm so thankful for the good news message that I've received from you, and I know my brothers and sisters echo that too. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving your life so that we have the promise of eternal life with you in heaven with the Father. But Lord, as you know, we know people we care about that they're not there yet. And Lord, whether we're the ones that are going to bring them along or somebody else, we want them to come along. We're glad in that sense that you're delaying. Lord, as much as I would desire to go home and be with you right now, I'm glad that you're delaying so that more will be there, more will come. Father, whatever is necessary to bring them to that point of believing, I pray that you would make it happen. Lord, I recognize that that's very possibly tribulation. It's life on this earth changing pretty radically. Because more often times than not, Lord, I know that's what you use even in our personal lives. You use trial and tribulations to draw us near. And if, Lord, that's what it takes, then we ask that that would come, Lord, that you would bring trial and tribulation to our land. And help us to be there as people are experiencing these bad things happening and offering them the only good news that they will ever hear, and that's the name of Jesus. Father, if there's somebody hearing this message right now and they don't really know what to do next, I pray that they would just come to you privately and say, Father, I believe. I believe that Jesus gave his life so that I could have eternal life. And today I want to change my relationship with him. Today I want to become his follower. It's just that easy. It's just make it a choice. But for the rest of us, Lord, I pray you would give us courage. You would give us boldness. Give us willingness, Lord, to care. That it would not be true of us what the guy had in his truck yesterday, Lord, that we don't really care. We're just glad we're going and we're not really concerned about who else is going with us. Father, from my own heart and the way that at times is probably true, I confess the ugliness of that sin to you, Lord. And pray you would cleanse me, that you would give us all boldness, Lord. And all of God's people were in agreement with this prayer, echoed it with an amen. Amen? Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.